So suppose we have a prokaryotic gene and we want to basically obtain many copies of the proteins that are encoded by that specific prokaryotic gene. Well, recombinant DNA technology allows us to basically carry out this process. And what it tells us is all we have to do is take that prokaryotic gene, place it into the appropriate vector, then introduce that vector into a bacterial cell, and the bacterial cell will essentially use its ribosomes, its cell machine, to synthesize the proteins that are encoded by that particular gene and then we can extract and collect and study those proteins from that bacterial cell. Now what's one application of this method? Well instead of using prokaryotic genes we can also use eukaryotic genes and this is especially important in a field of medicine where in medicine we're able to use this procedure to basically synthesize any protein any enzyme that we want to and that's exactly what allows patients with let's say diabetes to essentially survive for a very long time because they now have a way to obtain these proteins which are synthesized in the lab via this procedure now the major problem with this procedure or the initial problem that we had to solve when we were first developing this process was the following. Remember, eukaryotic mRNA molecules and prokaryotic mRNA molecules aren't the same. In eukaryotic cells, the initial eukaryotic mRNA molecule that is synthesized contains introns and exons. And so before that mRNA molecule is used, those introns have to, re have to be removed and the exons have to be spliced together. And the prokaryotic cell simply doesn't have the cell machinery to actually carry out that process because prokaryotic mRNA always only contains the exons, never the introns. So the complication with using eukaryotic DNA in prokaryotic cells is that these prokaryotic cells, just bacterial cells, do not have the proper cell machinery to modify the pre-mRNA produced from eukaryotic genes. For instance, eukaryotic mRNA contains exons that must be spliced out and that prokaryotic cell cannot carry out the splicing process. So how can we solve this problem? How did we solve the problem? Well, we solved this problem by essentially using an enzyme found in retroviruses known as reverse transcriptase. And what this enzyme does is it basically reverse transcribes, it forms a complementary DNA molecule from an mRNA molecule. So basically the way that we solve the problem is we take the eukaryotic cell that produces the proteins that we essentially want to extract and we extract the fully modified mRNA molecule that contains the poly A tail, the 5' prime cap and only the exons not the introns and so this is that molecule shown on the board and now we expose it to reverse transcriptase, which will basically form a DNA molecule that is complementary to this mRNA, and we call this a complementary DNA molecule, or simply CDA. And then we form the second strand of that DNA molecule to form a double helix, and we introduce this into an appropriate vector, so either a plasmid or a lambda phage, and now we take that and bring it into our bacterial cell, and notice when the bacterial cell reads this gene, the gene shown in red, it will produce the mRNA molecule that is already fully modified that only contains those exons and not the introns. And so now, because it doesn't have to worry about removing the introns and splicing together the exons, and it doesn't have to worry about the poly A tail or the five prime cap, it can easily synthesize that protein that we wanted to basically produce. And in this method, we can produce any type of protein and enzyme found inside our body. And that's why it is, it is a very, very important procedure in the field of medicine.
Now, the question is, how exactly, what are the steps involved in producing the complementary double-stranded DNA molecule that is complementary to this modified mature mRNA? Well, let's take a look at the following seven steps that basically describes how we can produce this double-stranded complementary DNA molecule. So we basically take our eukaryotic cell and we extract that modified mRNA molecule. And so this blue molecule is that modified mRNA molecule. It contains the five prime cap and the poly A tail on the three prime end. And it only contains the exons. It does not contain the introns. Now, before we can actually add reverse transcriptase into the mixture, we have to create a DNA primer. And we have to attach that DNA primer onto the three prime end of that mRNA molecule. Now, because all mRNA molecules in eukaryotic cells are modified with a poly A tail, what that means is it's pretty easy to produce that DNA primer that is complementary to the poly A tail because all we have to do is create a poly C tail because we know if we have the A's on this side, they will base pair with the T's on the other side. So we basically create a DNA primer complementary to the three end of the modified mRNA molecule and recall that all eukaryotic mRNA have a poly A tail on the three prime end. So we simply create a DNA primer with a poly T sequence. And now we mix the primer with our mRNA molecule in a solution at the right temperature and the annealing process will take place. And the DNA primer will hybridize with this poly A tail on the three prime end of that mRNA molecule. Now in the next step, in step two, we want to add that reverse transcriptase. That reverse transcriptase will bind onto that primer and in the presence of, of the four types of deoxynucleoside triphosphates, it will begin to synthesize that complementary strand, the DNA strand that is complementary to that mRNA. And so in diagram two, the red strand is that complementary DNA molecule, while the blue strand is that mRNA molecule. So in step two, we basically have this hybrid complex form where one strand is the DNA and the other strand is the RNA. And so in the next step, in step three, we want to reassociate or we want to dissociate, we want to break apart these two molecules because ultimately we only want the red molecule and not the blue molecule. Now, recall in our discussion of nucleic acids, we said that DNA molecules are more stable than RNA molecules. In fact, if we increase the pH, if we make our solution very basic, DNA molecules will remain intact, but RNA molecules will be destroyed, will be hydrolyzed. And so if we take the DNA RNA complex and we increase the pH, so we create a basic solution, the RNA will be hydrolyzed while the DNA will remain intact. And so after step three, we essentially isolate that individual strand of complementary DNA shown in red. Now, the next step is to basically form that other strand, the complementary strand to this cDNA molecule. And before we actually add the DNA polymerase so that it can synthesize the complementary strand, we have to once again create a primer. The problem is we don't know what this sequence here is. And so what we do is we use a special enzyme that adds a specific sequence of nucleotides onto the three prime end that we know. And so we add an enzyme called terminal transferase and this catalyzes the addition of specific types of nucleotides. And so let's suppose we want to add a bunch of deoxyguanosine triphosphates, so DGTPs. And so after step four, we essentially add a poly G tail to the three prime of this complementary DNA molecule. And now we know exactly exactly what the sequence on the three prime end here is. And so just like in case 
So just like in diagram one, where we knew exactly what the sequence was, and so we knew what type of sequence to build on that DNA primer, now we also know what sequence that DNA primer should have. If this is a poly G tail, we have to build a poly C tail. And so in step five, we build a poly C DNA primer, we add it into our mixture, and at the right temperature, these two will anneal, they will hybridize. Now, one important point that I did not mention in this part is this last T here contains an open hydroxyl group and that open hydroxyl group is needed to actually synthesize the phosphodiester bonds. And so now that we have this hydroxyl group, that transcriptase in this case can begin to synthesize those nucleotides. And for the same exact reason, now that we have the hydroxyl group on this side attached to this C. Now if we add the DNA polymerase in step 6, it can begin the synthesis and elongation and the replication of this complementary DNA molecule. And after step 6, we have the double-stranded DNA, uh, the uh, double-stranded C DNA molecule that we spoke about in this step. And this cDNA molecule, double-stranded cDNA molecule, can now be modified by attaching cohesive ends, sticky ends, to both sides of that DNA molecule. And once we attach the sticky ends, we can place it into the appropriate vector, either a plasmid or we can stick it into a lambda phage. And then we can expose the lambda phage to bacterial cells. Those bacterial cells will take up those double-stranded cDNA molecules and they can use them to basically transcribe the modified mRNA molecule that has the poly A tail, contains the five prime end, and also contains only the exons, not the introns. And in this manner, our bacterial cell can synthesize any protein that we desire. And so once the proteins are synthesized, we can extract those proteins by protein purification methods, and we now have a bunch of proteins that we can use for many different types of applications. And so that's exactly why this is a very important method, because it can be used in the field of medicine to basically save people's lives.